the role of a public health professional is to try and make sure that their politicians do have the evidence available to them to be able to put an appropriate argument. So the fact that they haven't had evidence is sometimes not just the fault of the politicians. They're very, very busy people. But it's actually the fault of public health professionals who could have done more uh, and could have been more persuasive. And the persuasiveness is not just with the individual politicians. It's also getting the ground ready for them. Welcome to another episode of Public Health Answers. We know that public health measures are crucial to COVID-19, but most importantly is to consider factors which have led to skepticism in terms of public health policies. The John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health has identified distrust and science as a major impact on our pandemic response. So once again, the intersection between public health experts, politicians and effective communication is key to a pandemic. And I'm therefore very, very excited to introduce you to Dr. Michael Moore, who is the past CEO of the Public Health Association Australia and the past president of the World Federation of Public Health Associations. He's a former Minister of Health and Community Care and um, has served as an independent member of the Australian Capital Territory Legislation Assembly over 10 years. Besides his work as a PhD scholar, he is also an active political and social columnist. Since 2017, he was made as a member of the Order of Australia. So thank you very much, Dr. Moore, for joining our session today. Um, I'll start with my first question. So how can public health experts and um, politicians work together to build up trust in science among the community when facing a pandemic? It's a very uh, interesting phenomena that we're watching at the moment, Rochelle, where trust in politicians uh, internationally has been declining. And there's a series of reasons behind that. So it's not just trust in the science, it's trust in the politicians as uh, as well. And part of the reason behind that, I believe, is because the influence that small parts of industry, very powerful parts, but small parts of industry have. And so when we see, for example, public health uh, professionals out trying to persuade governments that what they, that what we need to do in nutrition is to improve our diets and uh, and perhaps put some regulation around uh, healthy food and unhealthy food or similarly uh, with alcohol. Uh, we've been dealing with tobacco for a long time. But there are powerful vested interests that do not want that because it interferes with their uh, because it interferes with their profits. And so what we see is uh, a deliberate raising of doubt. Now we saw it uh, and see it very clearly, uh, from uh, court cases with tobacco companies uh, because what was revealed is that tobacco companies always knew for many, many years, knew just how lethal their product was. But they, did a, they used a whole series of techniques to persuade uh, politicians and the public that uh, that was not the case and they had a distraction. This is about personal choice. And, uh, and not about regulation. So uh, through that process, people began to get concerned that politicians' decisions were being made because of the influence of big business, and particularly because to get elected, uh, people need money, and often they relied on these industries to provide money to the political party uh, to, uh, to get them elected. And so... Uh, and so, if you like, doubt was sown about whether or not uh, politicians were being true uh, to themselves and, who, and were looking at evidence. Now, that's the background. But the reality is also that the vast majority of uh, overwhelming majority of politicians come into politics to make a better world. And they have a different idea about what a better world is, but they come in uh, to make a better world. And the, and the parliaments are places where 
the ideas about what is a better world should be tested. And that's where we should be using and seeing evidence. So the role of a public health professional is to try and make sure that their politicians do have the evidence available to them to be able to put an appropriate argument. So the fact that they haven't had evidence is sometimes not just the fault of the politicians. They're very, very busy people. But it's actually the fault of public health professionals who could have done more uh, and could have been more persuasive. And the persuasiveness is not just with the individual politicians. It's also getting the ground ready for them. So uh, let me give a very specific example from when I was a minister and I wanted to uh, stop people smoking where they, in any of the areas they're eating in pubs and clubs. And, and this was over uh, uh, around a quarter of a century ago. And uh, the big advantage I had was that there had already been a whole series of campaigns about uh, what smoking does to you and how bad smoking is for you. And so when I actually introduced this legislation, even though there were objections, even though tobacco companies were putting up uh, front uh, organisations to try and argue against it, nevertheless, even smokers understood what it was that we were doing. And that's because so many public health professionals have put so much time and effort into making sure that the public understood it. So we need to be supportive uh, as, uh, as well. Um, let me just, uh, as an aside, say, uh, you've asked me a question. I've tried to answer what you've asked. I did have 13 years in politics, very experienced at spending a lot of time answering a question, not answered at all, uh, of course. Uh, but uh, but we are, I am actually trying to get to the nub of the question uh, that, uh, that you're asking. So how can politicians build up trust and emphasize the need of vaccination for COVID-19 when facing something like an anti-vaccination movement? Uh, actually, the uh, anti-vaccination movement, I think, is sometimes uh, we exaggerate its importance. Uh, we have probably something in the order of uh, two or three percent of people who will never vaccinate, who oppose it strongly, and there is no argument that you can put, there is no scientific evidence that will influence them at all. However, we now have another group of people, maybe 15 to 20 percent, who have doubts. Now, I think that's healthy. Uh, certainly when I had my uh, children and uh, before I was involved in uh, vaccines and, and I was a school teacher teaching English and history, uh, you know, English literature and history, and I thought, well, you know, do I really want to put a needle in my baby's arm? And, uh, and so I had that doubt. But, of course, when, as soon as you go and look at the evidence, you go, well, actually, the, uh, any consequence from that injection, from that vaccine, is minuscule compared to the consequences of the disease. And that's the sort of uh, evidence we need to take. And we need to put it in simple, plain language like that. And we need to help our politicians to put it in simple, plain language in that way. Now, also, the vast majority of politicians have taken the, this same approach. They've listened to the evidence and they've implemented the evidence. And it's, by the way, it's the same with regard to uh, COVID-19. The uh, actions of public health professionals uh, uh, speaking to leaders of countries has, in most places, had a really positive impact. Now, there, it has been an, uh, a really unexpected, poorly understood uh, disease. However, uh, what we have seen is what we see in the media are those leaders who have not understood it because they got the worst situation. So Boris Johnson in the United Kingdom, uh, President Trump in the USA, Balasaro in Brazil. Uh, but the vast majority of leaders have been listening to their epidemiologists, uh, to their uh, uh, medical uh, health um, uh, people and making appropriate uh, decisions in the, in the light of as much evidence as they as they had. So I am not as negative as many people about evidence. I am concerned that we're seeing less of it and less reliance on evidence. Um, but I also think that we have a particular role. We as public health professionals have a particular role to play. And particularly young 
public health professionals. And when you go to meet uh, a politician, the first thing you do is go and look at the first speech they ever gave in Parliament. And the reason you do that is because they will tell you there why it is that they became a politician, what they wanted to do to make a better world. Now, they may become cynical. They may have been outnumbered by their colleagues in the political party. However, you understand what they're on about, and that helps you to relate and connect to that person. And if you can frame your information in terms of uh, that information, and then you're going to have more influence. And I think that's a really important thing. And in, when we're talking about influence, um, when I wrote my PhD on health advocacy, uh, I entitled it Politics, Power and Persuasion, the critical friend in public health advocacy. So the critical friend is, is a play on words. You are critical because, because, it's, uh, uh, a, a, because you're needed but you can also criticise. Now, politicians are used to being criticised. In fact, if you're in a minister, there's somebody who's paid to be in opposition to criticise you. Uh, so we're actually uh, um, used to that. What we don't like is the personal attacks. Because the, and here, when there are personal attacks, we've now moved away from the evidence. So what we, what we need to do as public health professionals uh, is try and engage, use the, uh, use the uh, information we've got and use it uh, to be critical based on the evidence if we, dis if we disagree uh, with a stance that somebody is taking. Uh, for example, I disagree at the moment on the stance of the government uh, in the way they tax alcohol. We can do it much more effectively and we can reduce the harm associated with alcohol. For many years I've disagreed with government on how they handle illicit drugs. And, and so we need, though, to, when we make that disagreement, we do it based on evidence. How can public health experts continue to advocate uh, for preventing disease and when facing something like a COVID-19 pandemic fatigue? Now, uh, look, I think public health professionals are always exhausted. Uh, we, uh, uh, there are so many things that are so important to us to make a healthier world. Um, but what we do is we work with other people. So one of the most important things as we look into the future is climate change and health. And from COVID-19, it's been put on the back burner. Uh, but... There are many organisations who are concerned about climate change for other reasons, not necessarily health. We need to work with them uh, and we need to use their evidence. And then we can build on that to say, well, this is the impact it's also going to have on health. When you increase the temperature two or three degrees on average, uh, look what has happened in Australia. We've had huge droughts. We've had extraordinary bushfires. And after our drought and bushfire, we also have had hailstorms uh, where the uh, hail is the same size as a tennis or a cricket ball. Uh, and so, uh, you know, these are major impacts and they are direct consequences of, um, of climate change and they have had huge impact on people's health. Over our summer period last year, um, there was significant um, uh, uh, respiratory problems because of smoke. We had two months but because of all the bushfires around near where I live, we had two months of uh, breathing smoky, smoky air. Uh, and so it should not be surprising that that had a major impact on, uh, on health. So, and they're just a couple of examples. There are many, many examples uh, in terms of food and nutrition and, uh, and, uh, and so on. Um, and the evidence is there. But we need to work with other people. We need to get that guiding coalition working whatever our public health issue is. So thank you very much for sharing your knowledge and naming all these key factors, um, as well as seeing like politicians as critical friend and really aiming for a good um, collaboration. And Rochelle, it's been my pleasure. In my, uh, in my uh, thesis, and I've published, I have 10 steps that are sequential steps to carry out advocacy. And uh, perhaps they might be, uh, uh, and they can be found 
on the website of the World Federation of Public Health Associations. Thank you.